Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy, happy Sabbath. Are you excited to be in the presence of the Lord? Are you joyful? Praise the Lord. We ought to always be exceedingly joyful in God's presence because in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. And at the right hand of the Lord, there is pleasure forevermore. We give him the glory for the privilege uh, he has given us to study together his wonderful word and to commune together in prayer. It's been an exciting journey these 10 days, and uh, we believe the Lord has blessed us. And uh, today is the day for celebration of the uh, incalculable blessings that God has bestowed on us so freely. Friends, the 10 days of prayer theme has been priorities of faith, priorities of faith. Faith. We're looking at Christian virtues in turbulent times. Christian virtues in turbulent times. And our study has been based on Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 to verse number 12. And from that text, we've looked at 10 messages. 10 messages. The first message, which was based on the first two verses of Matthew chapter 5, was titled, Priority of Proclaiming the Principles of the Kingdom. Priorities of Proclaiming the Principles of the Kingdom. And that study was based on, as I mentioned, verses 1 and 2, where Jesus establishes the foundation for what was to follow, known as the Beatitude, his revolutionary counterintuitive and countercultural, you know, messages that transformed his generation and generations after him. On day two, our study was priority of poverty in spirit. And that was inspired by Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 3. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Look at poverty in spirit. And then we went on to look at the next day's message, priority of pain. Priority of pain. And that was based on Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Then we looked at the fourth day's message, priority of placidity. Priority of placidity, and that was based on verse number 5 of Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And then we went on to the next day's message, which was based on Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. It's important for us to know that that ends the first part of the beatitude. So the first four beatitudes are actually about our relationship with God. They are about our vertical relationship, our relationship with God. Then the next set of beatitudes are concerned with our relationship with others. And so we went on to look at them the first one in the last four uh, was basically from Matthew chapter number 5 and verse number 7. And this has to do with the merciful. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy or obtain mercy. And then we went on to the next this message, number 7, priority of pure-heartedness. Priority of pure-heartedness. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. Very amazing text there. And then we went on to the next this message, uh, the if they, priority of peacemaking. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God or the sons of God. The next this message, day nine, 
priority of persevering in purity. And that was based on verse number uh, 10 of Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And of course, we look at the next and final day's lesson based on verses 11 and 12 of Matthew chapter number 5. Blessed are you, the text says, when men, you know, revile you or persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. And Jesus says, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. And then he went on to say that so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And so we look at priority of patience in provocation and persecution. So as I mentioned, the beatitude actually divides into two major parts. The first having to do with our relationship with God, and the second batch of the Beatitudes are concerned with our relationship with uh, others, which no doubt is the outworking of uh, our justification and our sanctification or the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So we concluded a study of the Beatitude in 10 days, to God be the glory. Today, we are concluding our program and as I mentioned, is just for celebration. And we intend into this message to bring everything to bear in a more applicable and pointed way. And I believe the Holy Spirit is poised to speak to us today. Our text is from Mark, Mark chapter 6 and verse number 8. I ask you, if you will, to please turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 6. And verse number 8. Mark chapter 6, verse number 8. Now, as you flip the pages of your Bibles to Mark chapter 6 and verse number 8, permit me to remind you, friends, that I believe in the supremacy of the Bible. I believe that the Bible is not just the ultimate authority, it is the sole authority. I also believe in the sufficiency of the Bible. Uh, this book is sufficient to make us wise unto salvation. And finally, brethren, I believe in the summation or the totality of the Bible. I believe that all scripture comprising the Old and the New Testaments only is God's inspired word. If you believe that, we mean say amen to God. So on that affirmation, we're going to read to your hearing, Mark chapter 6 and verse number 8. The Bible says, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Inspired by this text, our message today is captioned, Priorities of Faith. Priorities of Faith. May we ask the Holy Spirit to lead us now as we study. Father, we thank you for this glorious privilege to study together your wonderful word of life. Today, as we study your word, we ask that the Holy Spirit, who inspired the Bible in its entirety, will illuminate Micah chapter 6 and verse number 8, and will give us insight for living. As it has pleased you, Lord, to use a frail, a filthy, and a feeble vessel as myself. I do not ask for mighty words of human wisdom, to move the audience. Or ask right now, O Lord, is that humanity will diminish and that divinity will dominate as you speak to us pointedly, powerfully, and 
personally in the name of Jesus Christ and the people of God say amen. Priorities of faith. Friends, Micah was written to Judah and the purpose of the book was to confront the Jewish nation of that day for their outward only approach to God. Their approach to God, which was largely ritualistic, ceremonial, and void of inner transformation. Brothers and sisters, please note that they banged their relationship with God on their temple attendance, and today we would say on their church attendance, and on the Levitical sacrifices. They interpreted and they evaluated their relationship on that basis. Not just that, friends. They thought that they were good with God simply because they went through the motions of Old Testament worship. They went through the motion of attending church. They went through the motion of paying tithes and offering. They went through the motion of doing all of the religious ceremonies and practices. And friends, they checked the religious boxes and they found themselves to be okay. Sabbath observance, checked. Paying of tithes and offering, checked. Attending church on time, checked. And all other, you know, outward worship experiences were all checked and they felt they were right with God on that basis. And so Micah calls them to tax. He calls them to tax just as Jesus did with the Pharisees centuries later when he said, These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Matthew chapter 15 and verse number 8. So in this text, friends, if you study the beginning verses of Micah chapter 5, I mean chapter 6, if you study verse 1 to verse number 5, you will realize that God takes Israel to court. The king of the universe, who himself is the judge, takes Israel to court. And listen to what he says to them. Do you realize all that I have done for you? He calls the mountains as, a, as witness for they were there when God brought Israel out of Egypt. So God is the judge. God is the one who is actually taking Israel to court. And God calls the mountains to be witnesses against Israel. He tells them when I passed you through the Red Sea, when I defeated your enemies, I did all these things for you. In other words, I saved you. I saved you. So take note of the fact that Micah chapter 6 and verse number 8 is presented in the context of salvation. The context of salvation. What God is requiring in Micah chapter 6 verse 8 is a requirement for those whom he had saved or redeemed. So you see, notice, this is what God said to them in quote. Now they were called to speak back or to make their own depositions in court. And listen to what they said. The text says, uh, uh, I mean, God, in fact, told them that he was weary, uh, uh, you know, he, he look at the text. God says, how am I a weary burden to you? Am I, have I become so burdensome to you? Now comes the prophet's answer in the words of the people. So here the people speaking to God now in court. Listen to what they say in verses 6 and 7. They say, with what shall I come before the Lord? And bow myself before God on her. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand of ravens of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? So see Israel's question to God. The question is, so what should we do? What do you expect? Take note of the fact that this question is asked in the context of salvation. Now that you have saved us, and you've made your deposition, and you call all these things, you say all these things, what should we do? And then God's response to them can be found in our text. 
Micah 6, verse 8. God says to them, He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? This was God's response to them. Friends, this text is a major text. It is so significant that according to G.L. Rubisi, this verse stands as the motto of the archive of religion in the reading room of the Congressional Library in Washington. This text is so powerful that Rod says this is the quintessence, the quintessence of the commandments as the prophets understood them. This text is so profound that J.M.P. Smith calls it the finest summary of the content of practical religion to be found in the Old Testament. So powerful, friends, the board says or observes that the rabbis who commented on this particular verse in the early centuries of the Christian era called it a one line summary of the whole law. Very important text, friends. And today, by the grace of God, we can glean from this text this big idea. The priorities of faith are to love God and love others. Let me say that again. The priorities of faith are to love God and love others. We will unpack this big idea and expand on our key text today by looking at three important points, in fact, two important points. The first point of the text we will look at is the prophetic prescriptions. Prophetic prescriptions. The second part of the text we will consider it has to do with prescribed priorities. Prescribed priorities. Let's look at the first part of the text. Come with me to Micah chapter 6 and verse number 8. The text says, notice this, the text says, He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. In there we see the proclaimed path. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good is good. And friends, the Hebrew there, nagad. That word for he has shown you, O man, means to tell. That word for shown means to report, to make known or declare something. It means to make conspicuous. And the idea is to place a matter high, to make it conspicuous before the people. Which means is that God has elevated what he had communicated to them as priority. He had put it at the place where it must be considered priority. He has shown you. Which means that God's word is clear concerning these priorities. But the text also mentions good. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. The word there should be translated, what is the good? The definite article there must come with that good, which means it is a technical term for the stipulations of the covenant, specifically between the Lord and Israel. The point is, he has told you the things that enable you to satisfy the stipulations of the covenant. God has been clear. He has made his positions clear. But friends, please note what Hosea Chapter 6, verses 4 and 6 tell us. The Bible says, What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? That's referring to the northern kingdom. What shall I do with you, O Judah? That's the southern kingdom of Israel. For your loyalty is like a morning cloud, and like the dew which goes away early. Notice this one. For I delight in loyalty. That's morality. Rather than sacrifice, that has to do with ceremonies, and in knowledge of God, that's also moral, moral standards, rather than burnt offerings having to do with ceremonies. God had made it clear to Israel what he desired of them, what he wanted from them. Friends, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 11. Notice what the text says. 
To what purpose is the multitudes of your sacrifices to me? Take note, Hosea tells us what God wants. He wants loyalty. He wants obedience. Then, notice here, he comes in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 11. God comes here and says, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord. Notice this point. I have had enough of burnt offerings, of rams, and the fat of uh, fed cart, uh, cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. What is God's point? I don't really take pleasure in sacrifices. I'm not interested in your ceremonial services. Now let's go further. In verse 13 of Isaiah chapter 1, the Bible says, Bring no more futile sacrifices. He says, I don't need your sacrifices. I don't need your incense. Your incense is an abomination to me. The new moon, I don't need it. The Sabbaths, I don't need them. I don't need your ceremonial Sabbath. I don't need your Sabbath. The calling of assemblies, I don't need your church services. I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. In other words, you have services, you are attending services, I don't need any of those things. But what does God want? You don't want our incense, new moon, Sabbath, Sabbath worship, calling of assembly, assemblies in church, you don't need any of these. Well, God does not stop there. In Isaiah 1 15, he says, when you spread out your hands, I will hide my face from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. God says, I don't need your prayers because your hands are full of blood. Well, friends, Isaiah 58 verse 3, God continued to tell us what he doesn't want. He says, why have we fasted? They say, and you have not seen. Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? In fact, in a day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. So God says, I don't need your fast. I don't need your, 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 your offerings. I don't need your incense. I don't need your Sabbath. I don't need your worship services. I don't need your tithe. I don't need your offering. I don't need any of those things. Oh, friends, verse 5 of Isaiah 58, God goes on. Is it a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a, you know, borage and to spread out sackcloth and, 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 and arches? Would you call this a fast, an acceptable day to the Lord? So God says, I don't need your fast. I don't need your fast. So what does God want? He gives the proclaimed path. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. Then he gives the prescribed priorities. What does God want? He does not want our fast. He does not want our offering. He does not need our tithe. He does not need our Sabbath worship. He does not need anything that represents external religion. Now he gives the prescribed priorities. What is it? He has shown you, oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? The prescribed priorities. What does the Lord require of you? But friends, that word require, darach, the word means to seek with care. What is the Lord keen on? It means to inquire. What is the Lord trying to ascertain about our worship? It means to inquire. What inquiries, uh, you know, is God making? The word means to investigate, to examine, to study. In fact, friends, the uh, 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 participia form of the verb suggests that it is an ongoing expectation on God's part. What is God consistently coming to our services to find? What is God consistently coming to our homes to find? What is he looking for? In other words, what is the prescribed priority? What are the prescribed priorities? Oh, friends, notice Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. What is God looking for if he's not looking for our Sabbath worship? 
What is he looking for? If he's not interested in our tithe, our offering, our, you know, our, our, our gifts. No. What is he interested in? Isaiah chapter 1, 16 and 17. The Bible says, notice, wash yourselves. And make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Are you there with me, everyone? What is God interested in? He says, stop doing evil. Put away your evil ways. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressors. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Isaiah 56, 6 and 7. The Bible says, is this not the fast that I have chosen? What is it, Lord? To lose the bonds of wickedness. To undo the heavy burdens. To let the oppressed go free. And that you break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? And that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out? God says, this is what I'm interested in. Take the poor to your homes. This is what I'm interested in. Feed the hungry with bread. This is what I'm interested in. When you see the naked, cover him. This is what I'm interested in. Do not hide yourself from him. Do not hide yourself from your own flesh, your own human being. Your own fellow human being. So God is not interested in our tithe, our offering, and all these things as priorities. He's interested in losing the bounds of the wicked. Taking away the burdens of those who have cumbersome burdens. Letting the oppressed go free. Breaking every yoke of bondage. Sharing our bread with the hungry. And bringing to our homes the poor. Let me ask this question. Who do you carry home on Sabbath? Is it said the visiting preacher and the pastor and the pastor's family, and the elders, and the other leaders that you carry? Or do you carry the poor who is really hungry and needs the kind of food you have at home? Who do you carry home? Who do you call to eat with you on Sabbath when you open your car trunk and take off your wonderful food for, you know, eating in the afternoon? Who comes to eat some? He said, that brother, way at the back, who is really hungry, has not eaten two days. He dragged and came to church to worship God on empty stomach. Is it the one that you invite? Or you invite someone who really does not have need for your food? What is God looking for? He says, carry the poor to your homes. Oh, friends, we see the prescribed priorities. Now, God is expanding on exactly what he wants, what he's looking for, what his priorities are, what the priorities of faith are. What are they? Verse 8b of Mark. Notice, friends, that we find two sets of priorities. Listen, kingly. Priorities concerning people and priorities concerning God. If you look at the text carefully, Normally, even when we started the Beatitude, the priorities concerning God come first. But in Mark, the priorities concerning people come first. Because God wants to make a point. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. He's beginning from the fundamental area of our relationship with others. So he gives us priorities concerning people. What does he say? Number one, he says, Practice probity. Practice probity. In other words, he says, what does the Lord require of you? To do justice. What does the Lord require of you, Nairobi Central Church? To do justice. What does the Lord require of you, Kenya? To do justice. What does the Lord require of you, Liberia? To do justice. Practicing probity. 
practicing, you know, equality, practicing, you know, equity, practicing the rule of law. Friends, notice what the text says. But to do justly, and when you look at that in the text, it's mishpat. A mishpat is the key word in the book of Mark. You find that word mishpat in chapter 3, verse 1, chapter 3, verse 8. Verse 9, chapter 6, verse 8, chapter 7, verse 9, you find it there contrasted with injustice in Micah chapter 3 and verse number 10. And it conveys the primary sense, please hear me everyone, of exercising the processes of government. Oh, God have mercy. Exercising the processes of government. The way the judiciary handle matters of justice. The way... The executive implements the laws. Friends, it is clear the way the legislature creates laws. Are they consistent with the principles of God? The policies of the church, the practices of our church, our local church-related uh, practices, how concerned are they for the least, uh, the, the, the least fortunate? But well, friends, the Bible says that God desires justice. God desires justice. He says, do justly. To do justly means to act with equity. To do justly means to act with fairness and deference to those who are a weaker society position. Those who find themselves in weaker societal positions. The poor. The not so fortunate to have a job. Not so fortunate to be educated. Those who are marginalized. The minority tribes. Those who have different kind of challenges. Women. Children. The Bible says equity, justice, and, and, and fairness, deference must be given and shown to them. Oh, friends. The opposite of the violence, oppression, fraud, lying, and injustice that the Bible describes in Mark chapter 6, verses 10 to 12. That's what God says we should give to his children. Equity, fairness, and deference. But well, friends, notice what the Bible says in Amos chapter 5, verse 24. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like ever flowing stream, like mighty stream. God is saying he requires justice. He requires justice, fairness, equity, deference to the poor, to the least, least fortunate, to the needy. God says seek to help them. So the first thing we see has to do with God's concern for those who are least and less fortunate who are having difficulties. So practicing probity, to do justly. The second thing is passion for pity. Passion for pity. He says God requires that you do justly or do justice. God also requires that you love mercy. Love mercy. What does it mean to love mercy? Oh friends, the word that is ihav. It means to love dearly. Above all other laws, as a matter of fact, a have describes love that is between a man and his wife. As you see in Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 4, it also describes love that is between friends like David and Jonathan in 1 Samuel, chapter 18, verse 3. So God says, love, mercy. Love, mercy. What is he saying, friends? What does it mean to love mercy? When you look at that word in the LXS, which is the, the, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the e Hebrew Old Testament, you realize that in place of that word ehav, God uses the word agapao. What is agapao? It's from agape. And that is the word for divine love, for unconditional love. It is God-like love. It is God-energized love. It is supernatural love. He says this is the kind of love you should have for mercy. This is the kind of love you should have for mercy. Oh, friends, the word is in the present tense. And it means that this loving mercy should be your lifestyle. Being merciful should be your lifestyle, should be something you desire to do, should be something you pursue. Oh, friends, he says you are to love mercy. Love mercy. The Hebrew 
Therefore, mercy is hasad. It is the idea of faithful love in action. Covenant love. It reflects the loyal love of Jehovah himself for his people. It speaks of relationship and covenant obligation. Love mercy. Let a man love his wife. Love mercy. Let God love the world. Love mercy. Pursue it. Oh, friends, love covenant. Pity for the needy, for the sick, for the less fortunate, for people in difficult situations. Love mercy. Oh, friends, it's interesting that the LXS translates that hasad for mercy as a leo, which describes the outward manifestation of pity and it assumes need on the part of those who are recipients of that mercy. He says, love mercy manifests pity to those who are needy. Do you pity the poor? Do you show kindness for the least fortunate or the less fortunate? Do you find, you know, it's a, a pleasurable thing to help people who are in destitute situation, who are experiencing perplexities and difficulties? Do you truly love mercy? God says what he desires of you is to do justice and to love mercy. Oh, well, friends, in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 17, listen to what scripture says. He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he will pay back what he has given. Listen kingly. What that text means is that the poor is God's responsibility. Listen kingly. The poor is a beneficiary of God. The poor is a dependent of God. Listen kingly. And anyone who helps the poor is doing favor for God and God is so faithful that he will pay you back. That's what the text is telling us. Paying the poor is being merciful to them. Oh, friends, in James chapter 1 verse 27, the Bible says, religion that is pure and undefined before God, the Father is this. What is it? What is good religion? It says, to visit orphans. What is good religion? To visit widows in their affliction and keep oneself unstained from the world. God defines pure religion. And interestingly, he doesn't say pure religion is to go to church on Saturday. He doesn't say that. Pure religion is to pay your tithe and offering. He doesn't say that. So what's wrong with Sabbath observance? Nothing, friend. We're discussing priorities of faith. Are you there with me? We're discussing priorities of faith. The things we think are inconsequential in our relationship with God, God is saying, hey, there's a problem with your prioritizing of religious matters. Prioritize visit to orphans. Prioritize visit to widows. Now listen kingly. A typical or clear description or illustration of this principle is in Luke, where Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan, where there was someone who fell among thieves and was beaten and was humiliated and was wounded. And guess what? Listen kingly. The first guy to pass was a priest, a pastor. An ordained minister of the Seventh-day Adventist Church passed. He passed downtown Nairobi. And there was this man beating up, lying there on the street. And the priest said, let me do some preference analysis. I have to go for the 8 o'clock service. Because in my church, Sabbath school starts very early. And if I take this man to the hospital, I will be late because the cameras are waiting. My sermon is already ready. He says, as I look at the priority list, priority number one, church service. Number two, maybe after church I will come for this brother. The second guy came, he was a Levite, which means he was from the priestly family. Today he will say he was an elder. He was a deacon, a deaconess. And this guy came and he looked at the man and said, priority 
analysis. Priority on my list, number one, go to church. Number two, I could come back for this guy. Then, quote unquote, an unbeliever, a Samaritan, who was not believed to be a proper Jew, who was not believed to be okay societally, he was a mixed breed, a mixed race, or something that was outcast. He passes by, he sees the man, he too had to go to church, he too had to go to the mountain to worship, he too had to go to different places to worship, but he says, priority number one is to help this man. Priority number two is to go to church. This is revolutionary. Friends, yes, I just said that. That sick neighbor you left in his or her room and walked away should have been prioritized this morning. That widow that you left in destitution and you brought huge chunk of offering to give to this church, there's something wrong with you. Priority number one, visit orphans. Visit widows in their affliction. If that is clear, say amen. Let me say this quickly, friends. Did you know that the first part of Mark, chapter 6, verse 8, is a summary of the first four Beatitudes? Sorry, the, the last four Beatitudes. They are about our relationship with others. What does Jesus say? In the fifth beatitude, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. What does Jesus say in the second beatitude? Blessed are the pure in heart, people of integrity, people of moral uprightness, for they shall see God. What does Jesus say in the next beatitude? He said, blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called the children of God. What does he say in every beatitude? He said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The first part of Mark is a summary of the last four beatitudes of Matthew chapter 5. If that is clear, say amen. And can I also inform you that it is also a summary of the last six commandments. Oh, let me tell you why. Matthew 22, verse 39, the Bible says, the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Why am I saying this, friends? Love to your neighbor is what Mark is proclaiming as priority number one in this kingdom, in the kingdom of God. What does that mean? If you love your neighbor, you will respect and honor your parents. If you respect and honor your parents, you have fulfilled the commandment number five that says honor your father and your mother, which is the family principle of love. If you love your neighbor's friends, you will value life. If you value life, you have fulfilled the sixth commandment, which says you shall not murder, which is the felony principle of love. If you love your neighbor, you will preserve morality. If you preserve morality, you have fulfilled the seventh commandment. You shall not commit adultery, which is the fidelity principle of love. If you love your neighbor, you will respect the property of others. If you do that, you have fulfilled the eighth commandment, which says you shall not steal which is the fraud principle of love. If you truly love your neighbors, you will be honest in your relationship with one another and if you do that, you have fulfilled the ninth commandment which says you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, the false witness principle of love. If you truly love your neighbor, you will not covet that which belongs to another and if you certainly follow that commandment, you have fulfilled the tenth commandment which says you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall shall not cover your neighbor's wife nor his male servant which is the fulfillment of the fulfillment principle of love brothers and sisters you will not even cover the female servant nor his ox or his donkey nor anything that is your neighbor's why because you have fulfilled the law of god love is the fulfillment of the law 
So Marker, the first part of chapter 6, verse 8, is a summary of the beatitude, the last four beatitudes. It's also a summary of the last six commandments. If that is clear, say amen. Now the second set of priorities are priorities concerning God. What are these priorities? Notice what we see in the text. The path to personal, com personal communion with God. What does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love mercy. And then he says, to walk humbly with your God. To walk humbly with your God. Oh, well, friends, that expression, walk humbly. The word walk is halak. It means literally to walk, but figuratively, this verse speaks of how one conducts himself or herself in his or her daily life. It speaks of one's behavior. It speaks of one's lifestyle. So in your life, walk humbly with your God. But the text says you must walk humbly. What's the meaning of humbly? The, the Hebrew word there is sana. Sana means to be lowly, to be modest, to be humble, and it is used only here in the Old Testament. It means to act submissively to your God. Oh, friends, James chapter 4, verse 7. See what the Bible says? Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Submission to God is priority number two. Submission to God. And friends, this is also a summary of the first four Beatitudes. Beatitude number one, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Spiritual poverty is our acknowledgement, our recognition of our spiritual bankruptcy, our need for God. Spiritual poverty will lead to the second one. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. This has to do with spiritual pain. It has to do with weeping for our sins, being sorrowful for our sins. When we recognize our bankruptcy, then we recognize our sinfulness. We are sorrowful before God. We repent before God. Then we go to the next principle, which is the third beatitude that says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness is again your humility before God. We go to the fourth beatitude. What does it say? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Oh, friends, when you hunger and thirst for righteousness, God comes and fills you with the righteousness of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. If that is clear, say amen. It summarizes the first for beatitudes of Jesus. Walking humbly with your God summarizes the four beatitudes. And interestingly, ladies and gentlemen, it's also a summary of the first four commandments. Matthew 22, 37, the Bible says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Then he continues, friends, if you love God, you will indeed make God number one in your life. If you make God number one in your life, you have fulfilled the first commandment, which says you shall have no other gods before me, which is the fundamental principle of love. If you love God, you will worship him and reserve worship for him alone. And if you do that, you have fulfilled the second commandment that says you shall not make for yourselves a carved image. You shall not bow down to them, which is the focus principle of love. If you love God, you will respect and reverence his holy name. If you do that, you have fulfilled the third commandment, which says you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Friends, it is a frivolous principle of love. If you love God, you will be anxious to keep your appointment with God every week on the Sabbath day. And if you do that, you have fulfilled the fourth commandment that says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, your God, which is the faithfulness principle of love. If that is clear, say amen. 
Love is the fulfillment of the law. Prioritize love for God and love for your neighbors and you have fulfilled the spirit of the Ten Commandments. Oh friends, the big idea of the message today is the priorities of faith are to love God and to love your neighbors. To break the eight beatitudes down, they simply say, love God, love your neighbors. To break the Ten Commandments down, they simply say, love God, love your neighbors. Listen kingly. Observance of any of the Ten Commandments that is not inspired by Holy Spirit empowered love in the context of having been saved by grace is called legalism. That makes the Sabbath useless. That's, that makes keeping all the commandments useless because you are a legalist, you are a moralist, you have not been washed in the blood of the Lamb, and you are not keeping the commandments as gratitude to God, but you are keeping them as way of any salvation which is impossible. Two priorities of faith. Ten days of prayer. If there is anything you must go home with today, God says, love the Lord. Love your neighbors. If that is clear, say amen.